we will now introduce our first resource speaker for this morning. I guess we're now ready to listen to our first resource speaker. Daniel Yo Sung Won is Associate Professor in Social Anthropology at the School of Arts and Social Sciences in Monash University, Malaysia. He is an urban anthropologist who conducts field work in Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. He researches on the intersections between cities, religion, migration, and civil society in Southeast Asia. He also makes ethnographic documentaries. Danielle holds a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. He was also Evans Postdoctoral Fellow at the Department of Social Anthropology, University of Cambridge in year 1997 to 1999. As a Senior Fellow of the Nippon Foundation for Asian Public Intellectuals between 2005 to 2006, he conducted fieldwork in Northern Philippines for the first time. Since then, he has been affiliated with the Cordillera Study Center, University of the Philippines, Baguio City. Our second resource speaker for Module 5 is Sir Romeo J. Turing Jr who is an instructor at the Department of Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences of the Visayas State University in Baybay City, Leyte. He finished his bachelor's degree in philosophy at San Carlos Seminary College, Cebu City, and his master's degree at the University of San Carlos, Cebu City. He is the youngest board member of the OGAT since 2019 and currently serves as the OGAT Vice President for the Visayas. He will soon start his PhD at Hiroshima University, Japan, to study the Filipino diaspora and anthropology of migration. His research interests include culture, history, philosophy, and the digital landscape. Friends, let's all welcome our resource speaker to discuss on Module 5 regarding the visual methods in ethnography Let's welcome Sir Daniel Yuseng Wan and Sir Romeo J. Turing Jr. Yes, morning, magadang umaga sa lahat po. O in Malay, uh, selamat pagi, tuan tuan and puan puan. Uh, I'm in Malaysia. Maybe Romeo, it's time for you to introduce yourself also so that people will see you first. Hi. Um, yes, uh, magadang umaga sa lahat po. Um, Romeo from uh, BSU in Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, my name is Daniel. It's uh, my English name, my Christian name. My Chinese name is Seng Guan. I am a Malaysian of Chinese descent. So it's a great honor for me to speak to uh, colleagues in uh, your university, your faculty members. Uh, I think it's the first time I'm doing this in this part of the Philippines. Uh, in the past, was always in Baguio City. So uh, we are both honored. Well, I'm yeah, both honored. Uh, I don't know about Romeo or Myung. I'm also quite scared <laughs> to be able <laughs> about doing this topic. Uh, in the sense that uh, I have not won any awards doing ethnographic documentaries, although uh, two or three of my documentaries have been selected for screening in international festivals. So please don't treat uh, me, and I think Myung also has so-called the experts. We are merely sharing our experience, our intimate experience uh, based on our, well, maybe some of us, uh, for me, about 10 years of making now and then documentaries. And I think Myung has started it about three, four years ago, maybe. Yeah. So you're merely sharing what we know. All right. So I believe um, Mam Tondo, Dr. Tondo has sent my, the first part of the, this session, the, the slides to all of you, right? Faculty members, right? Uh, because I am very conscious that we are not talking to undergraduate students, we are talking to colleagues, uh, so we shouldn't uh, talk down, uh, but nevertheless, the topic is new. So if you have a chance to go through the uh, slide, I'm not going to go through very uh, detailedly, only on certain key ideas I would like to convey and spend more time in discussion among my colleagues. Yeah. Okay, so with that, uh, let me see what else I need to say. Mm. Yeah, and also uh, bear in mind that uh, what we're dealing today has very much to do with what has been discussed earlier in other, uh, done by other colleagues from Pugat. Uh, the ones that I attended, especially Maria's one and Jesse one when they were dealing with uh, maps and photographs. 
So uh, some of the key points they raised, I will reiterate a little bit uh, to show that it is not those issues, those ethical issues, um, yeah, those moral issues, those political issues have not gone away, right? And it's still uh, around uh, in anthropology and also especially in visual anthropology. Okay, so I have sharing rights. Am I? Can I share? My PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you see? Just a hands up or something. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, we can see your slides. Oh yeah, before I forget, uh, in about maybe 10, 15 minutes, we'll be going into breakout rooms, all right? So the technical team who is ever helping, uh, who is helping me, we have to create uh, breakout rooms. I see, let me see how many participants there are now. Mm, oops, I have to unshare again. Okay, now my um, equal numbers. Okay, so I would think, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll decide now. All right, six breakout rooms, right? So randomly, everybody goes into six breakout rooms. Myung and I have the, uh, let's look at, uh, have the, we are not part of the breakout rooms, right? We should be free to roam around the breakout rooms. Okay, so with that, so that, that will happen about maybe 10, 15 minutes time after I've do, done the introductory stuff. Okay. So, uh, Daniel, Daniel, yes. you have to specify the number of minutes in the breakout rooms for them to be uh, able to do it. 20, How many minutes? Yeah. Uh, 15 minutes. Let's start at 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. 15 right. minutes. Invite me to join group. No, I'm not joining room six. <laughs> okay. Uh, where was I? I was sharing. Okay. So let me start. Right, so this is the introductory. Okay, and I thought we start with a little light. It's like can't you play? Is it hanging? That's convenient. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's go out again and slideshow. Okay, I'll try to play one more time and see whether it works. Clear the slide. This is your pilot speaking. My name is Adrian Oberhensley. I'm working from home today. <laughs> uh, I don't see anything. I don't see anything, Daniel. Are you playing something? Oh, I thought I shared again. It's not being said. It's not being seen. All right. Sorry. One more time. This is technology. We could hear something, but not see it. Something. Okay, one more time. Share screen. Share sound. From current slide. Let's cross our fingers. Play. This is your pilot speaking. My name is Adrian Oberhensley. I'm working from home today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the rest will be, I'll do it this way rather than play off the slide. Okay, so there'll be two parts. Uh, let me see, I'd like to see faces. There'll be two parts to this uh, session. Uh, I will handle the first part mostly, all right, which is about theory, the theory of uh, making, of doing uh, doing visual ethnography and by and by in extension visual anthropology, uh, we'll have a short break after that, and then uh, Myung will take care of the practical part of doing visual ethnography. Okay, let's start with this map. Okay, we were not. You can see right. Map of China. Uh, not map of China, map of the world done by the Chinese as far back as 1418. Yeah. So uh, we humans were not, we humans have uh, been very uh, engaged in making visuals, right? And the, the kind of visuals evolve according to the technologies we're able to master, right? Can you, you can imagine way about what 40,000, 30,000, 20,000 years our ancients uh, discovered 
uh, charcoal or discovered that the charcoal or the coal that uh, the wood that they, they they burn could be could draw right on caves and have their hands hence we have cave drawings and then they discovered that fl uh, certain plants have pigments and they use colors and then further down the line they started uh, etching on stones rocks monoliths right engravings and then we go on and on and on we have paper uh, and so on and so forth so humans were were always have always endeavored to represent the world around them. Uh, humans have that is that they perceive. Uh, they have always tried to um, convey this knowledge for perpetuity, you not know, for for people after them. Uh, they have always tried to uh, express emotions also, right? Uh, not just uh, in a sense, quote unquote, facts. They've always tried. Humans have always tried to express. Uh, their emotional uh, and subjective experiences, all right? Uh, if you like the poiesis, the aesthetics of being, of being a human. So our, our ancients have always done that. Now in this map of the world, if you look at it, this is 1418. You can see the rough outline of the world today, right? It looks distorted, but it seems to be pretty accurate, no? You can see Africa on your left a bit. The shape Daniel, of the, Daniel, can you enlarge a bit the map? We barely could see it. Uh, it's not on a slideshow. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to put it in slideshow so I can see what's ahead. Can you see now? I mean, move bigger, 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 bigger. Yeah. That's a lot better, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So you see China uh, attempted to, to map the world. All right, and uh, the book uh, has they explored, uh, has they then explored. All right, so this is 1418 before Columbus, before um, what's his name, Ferdinand uh, Magellan, right, uh, and so forth, and the circle of the earth. So, of course, the question arises how are they able to do that? Okay, we didn't have satellites then. How are we able to, to, to go off the ground and see this? All right, I mean, today's world, today's methods of cartography depends a lot on satellites, right? To be very uh, accurate, right? You'll, you'll, you'll become like birds, right? You fly from the air and you look down. So quite amazing, right? The kind of mathematics uh, that they were able to, uh, to uh, deploy to do this. Okay, here is another map, 17th century, done by the Dutch of Southeast Asia, All right? So they are cart uh, Dutch cartography again. Uh, pretty accurate, if you like, without without the use of satellites. Uh, the question to ask is actually, why were well, why were the ancient Chinese, the ancient Dutch, doing maps? Okay, uh, it is not purely for scientific reason, quote unquote scientific reason. It wasn't a neutral, uh, innocent uh, exercise. Okay, uh, to put it very simply, without going to all the details. Uh, it was a way of, it was a visuality of power, right? Uh, it, was, it helped them to visualize unknown territories or territories to be conquered or where the enemies uh, were staying, where were the, where were the so-called already existing quote unquote civilizations. So it was a map for a purpose. It was a practical map, okay? Besides navigating, of course, besides traveling uh, the seas, it was also to understand unknown quote unquote unknown territories, which were already most in most cases inhabited by other humans. Okay. So there is a visuality of power. Or you want to invert it, there is a power of visuality. There are power relations involved in the kind of visuals we make. So the examples I'm giving you are, are maps first. Okay. Uh, because that was the technology that was available at that time, right? Through maps, through paintings. Okay. Then when we went, go into the modern era, which is more close, closer to our time, uh, the invention of the technology of photography. Um, so this is what uh, I think Maria and especially Jesse uh, paid a lot of attention to, okay? Uh, I think, I, I know very well that in Philippine uh, history, Philippine anthropology, the name of Wooster is a bad name, <laughs> depending on who you listen to, all right? Because Wooster took at least, well, different reports, but I think it is, uh, according to Mark Rice, he took close to 20,000 photographs of the Philippines. Uh, most of them are found in the University of Michigan, but they are also scattered in other places, private collections and other public universities. 
So when uh, Worcester came at a time when uh, the technology of photography was uh, still new and he made use of these technologies. All right. So these are just some of the photographs. These are, I put it, I call it exhibit A, right? Exhibit B. Oh, wait a minute. Some of them are not Worcester. Okay, let me go back again. So Worcester is one of them. Now, Worcester was not the only one making photographs. Okay. Up north, where I do field work still in uh, Luzon, uh, there is a famous photographer by the name of Masfere. Uh, Spanish or Spanish origin, but married uh, in Kankanai Igorot in Zagada and stayed put and started the coffee industry there. He also uh, was a, a keen amateur photographer and he took a lot of photographs as well. All right? And today, if you go to Zagada, there is a Masfere Inn uh, that you can, um, that go, and can go and eat and all that. that, that, that those are the descendants of Masfere. Uh, so this is his photograph. Okay. Uh, this is back to Worcester again, Exhibit C. Uh, Ikin Annalyn, Dr. Annalyn Salvador Amores in uh, UP Baguio has written a whole paper article about this person. Um, you find in the caption, if you can see the caption, can you see the caption? In this caption, the way Worcester described him, I mean, if you can't see it, you could open up your slide on your site, all right, which I've sent earlier. He was not named. All right, this, this, this Kalinga guy was not named. Uh, and uh, if you look at Ikin's article, he, she, she, she was able to name this person by going back to the village where, roughly the village where this photograph was taken and people, his descendants remembered his name. All right, he has a name. Okay. Uh, but look at the caption, how he was described then. So this is a Worcester photograph. Just now before that was a Masfere photograph. And this is the most, well, the most recent I could find in terms of anthropological work. When I say recent, it goes back to 1980 by a Canadian German uh, anthropologist who comes every year to stay in Sagada with his wife, Bilia. Both of them have been affiliated with CSC Cordillera Study Center uh, since their PhD days, all right? And now every year they come back, well, except for the last nearly two years now because of COVID-19. And this is one of his photographs by this gentleman by the name of Joaquin Watts, right? And these photographs hang in the Cordillera Study Center in the U in UP, Baguio. So I've sort of shown you different kinds of photographs, right? Um, and I wanted to sort of have a little, oh, before I go there, all right. So yeah, okay. So again, the technology evolved, right? Uh, so by that time, Wooster was able to make use of also uh, moving images, okay? moving images, what we call films, to take um, moving images shots of quote unquote native life in the Philippines. I tried looking for it, the full version is 45 minutes, but I can only find clips of it in YouTube, right? So uh, it is that it provided in the link there. Uh, I won't show it in the interest of time. Um, but today, when, uh, when we deal with so-called ethnographic documentaries specifically, and more generally documentaries, uh, films historians, film scholars trace back not to native life in the Philippines, has the landmark kind of filmmaking, but to Nanook of the North. Yeah, Nanook of the North. So maybe this one I will show a little bit. Uh, it is found in full. It's quite long. Right? It's a feature-length documentary in YouTube. So I'm going to show a little bit of that. To give you a sense of how early more, uh, uh, if I can, where is my YouTube? When I open too many stuff, you cannot see it, right? Close, 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 close. Share again. Sorry about this. When I open too many stuff, I can't see it. Okay, let me open it again. Nanook of the North. Can you see Nanook of the North? Yes? Joe, can you see? Preface? It seems to be a starting page in all your 
all your starting page uh, visuals are there on the left. It could be seen. But we could see a moon, a full moon. Okay, there's a full moon in somewhere. Uh, hang on, slowly, slowly, slowly. I mean, move it, move it to another screen. Then we look at it. So that's why I wasn't sure about the timing because I expected all this problem. Yeah, screen one. You can see, right? Not yeah, we can see now. So I'm yeah, we have a, we have the screen of YouTube. Yes, correct. So I'm going to play Namlook of the North a little bit, just to show you. All right, it's a silent movie. Okay, it's playing now. Right, so is this uh, the Eskimos or the Inuit actually, the indigenous Inuits? So I'll just show about maybe four or five minutes, okay, at most. And then uh, to give, to discuss a little bit about its significance and how it sort of shaped uh, modern day documentary and even ethnographic documentary today. So this technique of so-called uh, putting the context, right, using of titles uh, before the movie is to give context is also still used by some documentary makers, including myself, to place the context of how the film was made, the context under which the films were made and who the subjects are. Then the story begins, yeah. So uh, it is silent because sound technology was not created then. Uh, or maybe it was about to be created. So uh, the cameras were very big in those days, heavy and big, and it was not connected to the, the camera. So if when some technology was created, it was separate. There were one person holding the camera to take visuals. Then there was another person with his audio recording device taking it, right? And that's why you see the notion, you see in movies behind the scene, they do what's called the clapboard, right? The thing is to basically use that marker to link sound and visuals together okay now with our so-called very lightweight cameras that we have uh, the sound is found in the recording device itself all right so we don't need to do that right but some some documentaries still persist in doing that because it allows the camera to move different directions and the sound can still be recorded of the same uh, subject all right so it depends on the context of what you want to do all right but basically what i'm saying now instead of a big crew of film uh, cameraman and sound person, you can now go to one person doing it, a, a single person filming and recording your, your subject. See a lot of intertext stuff, right? intertitles or titles, right? He gives a context by showing the map again. He points to exactly where the film was made. Robert Flaherty, uh, Flaherty, Flaherty yeah, uh, was an engineer, okay, he explained, right? So that's why he, he spent many years exploring for his company. So he was quite familiar with the place. He goes back quite often, okay? So again, this, this factor also has to be considered in whether you are a one-time a guerrilla, you know, hit and run filmmaker, or whether you, have, you, go, you are familiar with the locality and you go back time and time again. Okay, so I think I, uh, I will stop here and you can watch it in your own leisure. Okay, uh, let me open back my slide. Okay, what is the significance of this particular documentary? All right, so let me close this. Okay, 
The significance is this. Uh, by the time Robert Flaherty has made this, already there were other people experimenting with making films. Okay, he was not the first. Wooster was one of them, again, I told you, right? But the difference between Wooster and uh, Robert Flaherty's documentary was, if you had a chance to look at Wooster, he was taking what is today called actuality shots. He was just taking uh, shots of people doing things, right? In this case, uh, the Igorox, right? Uh, dancing with a gunster, uh, cooking, uh, no, slaughtering an animal, cooking the animal, and so on and so forth. Okay, it was it was a series of moving images of people doing things, right? No voiceovers, uh, and that's it, right? A series of just actualities. Now, um, Wooster didn't invent this method. His 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 contemporaries and even his predecessors were already doing that in the towns of Manila. Uh, in, in other urban centers, okay? They were just taking, let's say, putting the camera in front of a railway station and just taking shots of the train coming, people getting off the train, and then people uh, leaving the train station. Or they were taking videos of people in the street, just people walking across the street, uh, horse carriages going across, and so on and so forth, right? You find this kind of films, in fact, all over where there were Europeans uh, European colonies in Singapore, uh, in, in Malaya, in Saigon. Right? They were just taking a series of uh, video uh, films, moving images of people doing things. Sometimes you see in these, uh, these films, people aware of the camera. So they'll turn and they'll look at the camera and because they're not, they're, not, uh, they're not sure what this technology is about, they'll be like looking at it, you know, they'll be like, uh, some of them will be smiling, some of them will not be smiling, will just be looking at this strange device in front of them. So we have lots of this kind of films being made in the early part of uh, the century. So what uh, Robert Flaherty did was, instead of doing that, he was telling a story, right? He provided a kind of story, a narrative to all his shots, right? And one of them is done through the intertitles, right? He was giving context so people understand uh, where this is, who these people are, and then in between, let's say, for example, the famous uh, um, Namnook hunting for the seal thing, right? So he was saying that this is how they, 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 they found their food, that kind of stuff, right? So he was providing a story about a particular family, an Inuit family, uh, a Namnook and his family, about their daily lives, right? their daily ac uh, activities, what today we call ethnographic, okay? Now, uh, some people have questioned, and of course, uh, and this is part of post-colonial kind of stuff, uh, how authentic were these scenes? How real were they? Okay, the, How ethnographic were they? Uh, Robert Flaherty, in his memoir, wrote, uh, did explain some of the behind the scenes of the making of this film. And he did say that he had to stage some of them, right? He has to stage. By, by, by stage, I, I don't mean that he got actors. To, to take in for them, or right? this was not making a movie actors. These were uh, his research subjects doing things uh, in front of the camera, all right, for the sake of the camera. So for example, there were two, okay, uh, which he explained how it was done. Uh, in the documentary, if you've seen it, there's one part showing how uh, uh, Nandok and his family would go into the igloo, the ice igloo, to sleep for the night, all right? So you have shots of them going into the igloo, then inside the igloo, uh, getting ready to sleep. Now, the, the second one I was talking about, th that if he were actually inside the igloo filming it, it would have been impossible, almost impossible for two reasons. The igloo is very, very tight, very, very small. There would not have been enough camera angle to take the scenes in front of him. Number two, inside the igloo is very, very dark or, or not, let's say not completely dark, but dark enough that the camera would not be able to function. So how do you think he was able to do that? Hmm? Since I know Joe well, I'm going to ask Joe, how was he able to film that scene, Joe? <laughs> Inside the igloo, you think? Joe, you're muted. Yes. I'm going to yeah. put you. Oh, sorry, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, Daniel, my uh, visual, uh, visual anthropology is not one of my expertise, but but I think I would I would like to think that he was able to uh, get the uh, trust of the people in Iglo, 
to be able to enter the igla. I no, 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 sorry, I sorry. Will... That's not my question, Joe. Listen to my oh, question okay. carefully again. I'm okay. talking about the technical part of it. How was it able? Okay. He already he was friends with them because he knew them for so long, oh. right? But how was oh. it able to get into a? How he was able to show the scenes of inside the igloo while there are two technical problems involved. Number one is so small, it's so narrow. His camera couldn't been able to go inside. Number two, it was it would probably be was very dark. How do you think he could be able to do it? Uh, one thing technical, sure, you know, it's a for, technical problem. Yeah, it's a technical for problem. the lighting. I think he would have you know used some lights, some form of lights, uh, artificial lights inside. Artificial uh, in terms light. of the. Uh, in terms of the other, or probably reflectors, you can actually use a mirror, you know, from the light out, uh, outside uh, mm -hmm. to go into the uh, the darkened part. Um, I usually do that when I am not sure about the lighting uh, thing. Uh, when I'm doing my, when I was doing my field work in, uh, in uh, St. John, you know, for the dark ones, you know, use okay. some reflections. And right. then uh, the, the sound, uh, the, the photograph itself, uh, you can take separately from the sound and from the light. Thank you. Good guess, but you're wrong. <laughs> so in this it's case, it's not my expertise, as I've said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a technical problem. I never so claimed what, it. Yeah. So, so what what he did was he couldn't use reflectors because if you know the igloo, the architecture of the igloo, the the entrance is very narrow. Yeah, and able to be able to get the correct amount of light to the sun, even I mean in in the north, uh, in in Alaska, you know that uh, there's very little sun, or even if there's sun. Uh, it's a diffuse kind of sun. So what he did was, he actually have half the igloo. There was only half an igloo. In other words, he filmed only the first half of the igloo when the structure was. The other half was open air. So was he was using natural light to film people inside. So in other words, it was stage. It was like a stage, right? In order to get to see that. So some people might question, you know, if you're a purist, that's not authentic, no? Okay. But he was trying to solve a technical problem: how to film inside a very dark and uh, 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 congested area. Okay, the second thing that is very famous about him is that the stage one, the walrus hunting. If you've seen that video, uh, you, you show Nanook hunting with with uh, harpoons and all that kind of stuff. Now, at that time, already the the Inuits, the Eskimos, were not hunting with harpoons; they were hunting with guns. Okay. But he wanted to show the traditional life of the Inuits. So he got them to use back the harpoons. In other words, he was staging it. He was staging a traditional uh, hunt. Okay, again, again, the purists among us were asked, was this, was this authentic? Were you trying to so-called get indigenous people to perform something that they'd already left, let go some time ago? Okay. okay, nevertheless, despite these two failings, it's considered a landmark documentary because number one, um, there was a narrative uh, to to what to do the film sequences. He was trying to get audience to to become uh, more un, more intimate and understanding uh, about the life of the Eskimos, um, right? And and he provided, if you like, a very biographical, ethnobiographical uh, view of the Inuits, right? If you look at Wooster. Wooster's uh, stuff. These were like faceless subjects, right? People doing things, a group of men and women doing things, and they were nameless. Okay, they were just uh, mute subjects doing activities. Okay, so Norbert did something different, and which since then documentaries have tried to follow. Okay, so this is where we're going to have our first discussion. It's not a breakout room yet. Okay, breakout room will be coming soon already. So uh, I would like to invite my colleagues here. And I don't, so I will call upon your name rather than wait, okay, randomly. So I'm not picking on you so that we can have a discussion. So let's see. All right, so when you look at this set, first question, custom point, when you look at the samples of colonial era visuals, all right, maps, photography, and films, what, what are you able to learn from them? What do you feel gazing at them? What do you feel gazing at them? May I invite, uh, Melvin Anglis to say something to that question, just to get your thoughts. Mr. Melvin Anglis, are you there? Mm. So your visual is there, but maybe the person behind the visual is not there. So let me call somewhere else. John Lester. Are you there?
not there either. Amelia? Not there. Eugene? Oops, looks like nobody is around. Okay, Ro Myung, my colleague, I will ask you then. Oh, Amelia, sorry, I switch on you. Amelia, your camera is on. Thank you, Amelia. You want to, you're muted? Okay. Yeah, you would like to share? Uh, I'm actually not a participant, but I will be a resource speaker tomorrow. Oh, but okay. I'm Great. also into visual anthropology. Great, Amelia. So I do documentary, so I, I, I know what you mean by uh, making a story and uh, reconstructing the past, which is also uh, viable. But then uh, for an anthropologist, how would you look into that? Is it authentic mm. or fabricated? Okay, Amelia, uh, okay, it's great. It's good to share. It's good, good to have someone who, who does this. But uh, can you sort of address the first question here? Sorry, I didn't share the screen. So the first question here, I just want to know your thoughts and feelings about this. It's more about the colonial period, okay? This first question. Can you see the question, Amelia, mom? Yes, yes, I do. So when you look at this so-called Worcester pictures, all right, uh, he's been a lot of, he's getting a lot of criticism for the kind of pictures he's been he used to take, all right, of naked and, well, not naked, semi-naked uh, IPs and all that kind of stuff, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but if you look at this colonial era, right, that means the kind of visuals produced by people not from here, the Philippines in your case, what, are you able to learn something from this kind of visuals, right? Uh, yeah, well, actually, I'm familiar with the Worcester photographs, uh, and I use them a lot to decolonize uh, material culture and also our imaging of the indigenous people. I will tackle that tomorrow as well. But right. um, actually, um, what impressed me with uh, Worcester photographs is um, he was able to capture images which otherwise would have been uh, which we wouldn't have been which which we we couldn't have been able to use now for reconstructing our 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 indigenous cultures mm. okay so that is uh, although they are actually uh, colonial the intention of worcester was more to administer and sort of put the uh, different ethnic groups together to justify why the Philippines should be part of the American extension. Oh, okay. So, Amelia, how, how are you able to guess what he was doing, Wooster? I mean, how are you able to guess just on these photographs what was what, uh, his intentions for doing that kind of activity? I'm a photographer as well. Uh, I grew up doing photography, and um, and uh, he has his intention really was to justify why why we should be colonized all right so you're basically addressing the second question sort of yeah yeah there are good and bad intentions uh, if you look at um worcester's um biography but uh, i think i would judge it from the good more than the bad okay so let's say uh if you are you familiar with masferi's photographs or? yes i know masferi myself Oh, great. Excellent. So if you were to compare the type of photography Masferi did and Wooster did, do you see any essential difference in technique? Do you think, are you able to, if I did not name them, I mean, in the case you are familiar with them, let's say if a person who is not familiar with these two photographers, are they, are you able to distinguish good and bad colonial photographs? Um, Masferi, uh, I'd say, um did good photographs because he stayed with the community he immersed with the community and he had all the opportunity to even marry uh, into the community so that's quite a difference between being an outsider and being an insider photographer mm -hmm. documenting uh, a, peop a, a, a people mm -hmm. so uh, worcester was more the outsider masfury was more the insider Okay. So Thank they you. definitely will have two different perspectives. Yeah. So it is, in other words, what is beyond the photograph you're saying? It's not the photograph, the artifact itself. It's the relationship between photographer and photograph that sometimes gets reflected in the kind of photography taken, whether it's very highly, if you like, sensationalist photography, 
or so-called mundane photography, right? Sometimes it's reflected in the, the artifact. But most of this uh, is not reflected in the artifact no, itself, no, no, no. but it is in the, the captioning, maybe, the captioning of these photographs. It is reflected in the articles written in these photographs, about these photographs, yeah? Right, actually, um, it, uh, all photographs can be good or bad, depending on the text or the captioning you put, you put on it. Um, it can be, and depending on your purpose as well. So you put captions, uh, like when you put an exhibit, you have a theme. So you sort of try to write the story based on the theme. Yeah. In the similar manner, both photographers have their own themes as well. Okay, thank you. So it's a good starting point. So thank you, Amelia. I might call upon you again since. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah. later. Okay. All right, so, um, so the, in the selection of photographs I showed you just now in the slides, you, uh, especially the last two photographs, I wanted to draw your attention to the caption, actually. The way Wooster described his research subject, nameless, right? Uh, the Kalinga, he's called him the Kalinga man, as if this person represents all Kalingas, right? So a, a, a very overly generalized visual representation of Kalinga people. So he's using a particular to represent the general. Okay. Now in this, in this, the last photograph showed by Joaquin Walls, he gave a name to the caption, right? He named this person, Mrs. I forget her name. She gave the name, right? He personalized this person's name. Okay. Uh, he has a book actually. Uh, these photographs come from a, a book, a thin book uh, called Ritual Slash Life about uh, Sagada Igorots, right? And he ex he gives a fuller explanation of rituals and all that kind of stuff. Okay, all right. So I, I brought this kind of tensions up because uh, there are benefits in doing visual ethnography, and there are disbenefits, right? It is not a totalizing medium. Okay, there is it, it cannot do it cannot it's not a magic instrument in other words. Yeah. So what are the so-called benefits, right? Both photography and documentary moving images, all right? So I quote from, uh, again, one of the modern fathers of uh, documentary making is Jean Rouge, the French filmmaker. He, he invented another technique, uh, a bit different from, and this is where we talk about in the breakout room, a bit different from Robert Faculty. It's called Cinema Verité. Literally in French means truth cinema. So he wanted to use the, uh, and he was a trained anthropologist. Uh, uh, he had a previous, I think he was also an engineer. Then he became an anthropologist in Africa. And then he used camera to, to convey uh, ethnographic and anthropological themes. All right. And this is his famous quote. The camera is the best means for me to show you how I see you. All right. In other words, the camera for him is an extension of his research process, his research eye, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, this one less famous, but uh, a scholar, but good, nice quote, George, uh, Scott Hitz. Film is an emotional medium. It is not a medium of intellect and intellectual discourse. It is about engagement and emotion. I brought this up because, and this is the way we go, before we go to go to breakout rooms, and this is about these three things I want to talk about, actually. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's come to all these three major points. Now, the kind of anthropology that we know today, okay, uh, which my colleagues have talked about, it's, it's a kind of experience, right, where we participate, we observe, we live with our research subjects as much as possible, okay? In other words, it's a very multi-sensorial experience. It's audio, we listen, we watch, we vis visual, we smell, right, we read, that kind of stuff. So the ethnographic experience is actually multi-sensorial, but paradoxically, when we report about it, it becomes a discipline of words. It is reduced to text. We write about our experience, all right? We try to describe as much as possible and then we analyze, okay? So in other words, from a multi-sensorial and oftentimes for many of us who do feel, but it's very exciting because it's, we're learning new things, all right? It's challenging our whole worldview. But when we come to writing about it, I'm sure all, maybe Joe will have experience and many of us have experience. When we come to writing about it, it's like oozing blood or like writing blood. We're trying to squeeze blood out of stone to give back the same kind of vitality to our experiences, right? But what to do? That's the discipline, right? That's our, uh, well, that is the profession, right? That's what we're told to do. If you don't publish, you're gonna perish, right? So we publish uh, and we come up with all kinds of uh, 
to the best of ability ethnographies. Compared to visual anthropology, okay, now uh, you would have you would have guessed by now that uh, the technology of the visual came almost as uh, sight uh, uh, together when anthropology was created. All right. When the camera was invented, it was already used by anthropologists to go into the field. They were taking already uh, those who can afford it and those who have the technology were already taking photographs, taking photographs, and hence we have the legacy of those photographs. So in a sense, uh, the use of visuals, visual ethnography was almost uh, at the same point of origin with anthropology. Okay, except that it was always downrated, under undervalued, right? Because. Uh, the discipline required that we write about it and publish about it, okay? And the, the visuals were only used as a so-called supplement to illustrate certain points, right? The so-called the Kalinga man, or you know, uh, Filipino, Cebuano doing in kind of stuff, right? So it was always used as a supplement, okay? Um, but fast forward to the, today, uh, there are hardcore visual anthropologists who say that um, the visuals should not be supplement to writing alone. In fact, visuals, it's a kind of writing, it's a kind of textuality, right? And it's closer to reality, in fact, all right? Because it, uh, it cuts down the representation. It cuts down the uh, mis possibility of misrepresentation, right? So it is an anthropology, anthropology of the particular. The power of the of our cameras, right? Whether it's steel camera or uh, a moving camera, is that it captures actualities, right? What people are doing and saying, which no no amount of words, our words as anthropologists can replace. Okay, so it is that is is so called its benefit, its its power. What it doesn't have definitely, all right? And visual anthropologists uh, or people doing visual anthropologists acknowledge it, uh, acknowledge it. It doesn't have the ability to make abstract generalizations, right? It cannot relate the empirical to broader theoretical stuff, all right? Uh, whatever is going on in that fashion, uh, what is fashionable in that time, right? So that has to be done in, in writing. So if you like class, uh, classic and modern day anthropology in the textual form, it's strong in the anthropology of the general by using the particular. Visual anthropology is strength is that it is an anthropology of the particular, right? It's able to, to bring, to invite, to draw the viewers in too deep into the life experience of a particular research subject or research community, right? That's why the earlier quote that this one, film is an emotional medium, okay? Uh, um, and I think many of us already know that intuitively. I've been spending the last few weeks watching a lot of Filipino rom-com movies uh, to Netflix just to get myself reacquainted with, uh, you know, if you like Filipino culture, Filipino uh, Tagalog uh, language, and so on and so forth. And what strikes me about Filipino film compared to Malaysian film is such an evolved, such a culturally rich source of data, quote unquote about what matters in Filipino culture. Well, in this case, lowland culture, right? I'm not sure whether highland culture would depict uh, Filipino life that is, okay? And, and I'm, uh, I'm guessing that many of my colleagues here watch a lot of films, right? From young up to now, and you are very visually attuned, all right? There are certain things in those movies that you know by the nod of the eyebrow, uh, body language, and so on and so forth, that you're able to read, inter uh, read all right, even though it's not spoken compared to me, an outsider trying to look in, right? Kind of stuff. Uh, so in a sense, uh, I, 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 I would argue that all of us in this room, I'm making a state, uh, argument, are already quite visually attuned, okay? We are quite used to visual cues already, okay? In a sense, we, are, we can become already good researchers in the research in visual anthropology. You already have that cultural, uh, 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 what's the word, literacy in it, okay? It's about how to how do you generalize from the particular to the general? That is a bit of the problem, okay? How do you relate what you already know to broader cultural, social cultural theories or social cultural phenomenon beyond the Philippines even, all right? Okay, so the last point here before we go into breakout rooms, I think is this, yeah, I will, it's already 10 o'clock, is the anthropology of the visual, okay? So from, 
from being the so-called a second a poorer cousin to anthropology, visual anthropology has evolved today to a very important uh, form of research, uh, part of the research process. Okay, simply because technology, the the visual audio visual technology has 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 blossomed so much. Okay, all of you have smartphones. Okay, uh, I mean the other one was earlier. All of you watch movies. All of you watch TV, uh, television series. All of you watch the news. And in fact, just now. We started while waiting for the seminar to begin. We had a visual representation of your university, all right? An animated uh, visualization of the university. I don't know where it is, what it is now, what it looks like, or what it will look like. But I noticed two things about it. Uh, the people depicted inside the visual tend to be they look white to me. There are no there are no so called uh, non white people in the visuals. Yeah, it looks very Malinese. <laughs> In my audios, it looks clean and neat in the visual representation. So in that sense, that animation was a kind of representation of the future of the university, an aspirational representation okay, of the future. And again, just now, uh, after, that, after that little uh, publicity stuff, you had two visuals again, two very powerful visuals, right? your national anthem. In Malaysia, we just we are quite boring. We just sing the national anthem. We don't have the visuals. But uh, uh, when I was in the Philippines, you no, know, from going to the cinemas, I was quite struck by you know the use of visuals, the 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 the, the, the use of visuals to link back to the nationalist past, the anti-colonial struggle in the singing of the the national anthem. And the Filipino anthem, I think, for those anthems I've been listening to, is one of my favorite anthems. All right, for its so-called aesthetic and poetic uh, power. Okay. Um, and so on forth, so and so on and so forth. All right. So, so the anthropology of the visual, it's it's a viable discipline uh, for, for the research process. Okay. Uh, we have now social media and all that kind of stuff. All right. So we don't have to go and film people anymore. In other words, we don't have to make visual ethnography. The 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 visuals are there. We just have to ethnographize them. Right. We have to collect them. We have to observe them. We have to link the dots together. All right. For those of us who don't, uh, who think that it's difficult to go and find an indigenous people's group uh, to, be, to be to qualify as a visual ethnographer. Right. I'm an urban anthropologist. All right. Uh, meaning that I, I'm interested in how the urban setting reconfigures social relationships and cultures, including indigenous peoples from the Philippines, the Igorots who come as OFWs in Malaysia. All right. And they use a lot of social media. They use a lot of uh, visuals to, to, to cement and to project their egorotness in Malaysia. Okay, uh, so it is besides interacting with them personally on a on a one to one basis. I also, in a sense, follow their visual representation of themselves. So when I do that, and when I do write about it one day, it is an anthropology of the visual, already. Okay, so the rest you can read yourself. But I just want to say one thing before we're going to break up into ethnic groups, okay? Because I've given a lot of resources about what is the difference between ethnographic documentary and documentary. Um, it depends to who you read and who you talk to, all right? There are some purists who say there is some, uh, what do you call that? There is some uh, trademarks of doc ethnographic documentary that you cannot move away from. And that person is Jack Ruby, uh, not here. Jack Ruby, okay, an old American anthropologist who is, of course, uh, not of course, he, one of the uh, masters of, uh, recognized masters of ethnographic documentary, and he's quite a purist, right? He wants to do it in the Robert Flaherty way, in a sense. There must be context. It must be about particular people, right? It must be uh, not staged as much as possible, okay? It has to be authentic and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, there are people uh, like Carl Heider and, 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 and his colleagues which are less curious. They even allow for ethno fiction, right? For people to reenact uh, scenes, okay? Uh, because you were not there to film it when it happened, right? You can ask them to reenact in order to tell the story. Because I'm sure you all know, uh, ethnographic film is a visual medium. You cannot tell, you have to show. You have nothing to show, you cannot tell. Right, then it, that becomes your uh, writing already. Okay, so uh, so some 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 uh, one of my pop, one of my favorite actually uh, filmmaker and scholar is uh, named by the name of David, uh, David McDougall from ANU. 
still functioning uh, ethnographer, and he has written a lot about this. And I've, uh, in his writings, he and in, even in the or YouTube I've shown you, he sort of declares that for him is he finds it very difficult to disting, distinguish between the two: what is ethnographic of it, uh, what is ethnographic documentary, and what is pure documentary. Right. So the the the, the lines are very porous these days. Right. It's very much depending on your intention. And I would argue when we come to Myung's session about the circumstances, sometimes the circumstances does not allow you to be ethnographic. Okay, but you can make a documentary still, right? I will, I will decipher that, that mysterious statement afterwards, what I mean by it. So, uh, the circumstances uh, does not allow you to be ethnographic, but you can still make a documentary about it. All right, so what are we going to do next? Uh, no, okay, here. Yeah, now we can talk about this later. I think already uh, this point was raised up when I was speaking with Amelia, right? We were discussing. It's not just what is in the frame, what is in the still photography or the moving photography that, that determines our interpretation of it, our understanding of it. A lot of it is outside the context in which the text is embedded, whether it's a written text or the visual text. All right. In, in scholarly literature, we use the word intertextuality, right? There's a use, uh, all of us, it doesn't mean you're a scholar, you can only do be intertextual. All of us, even ordinary lay person who watch Filipino cinema or Malaysian cinema, is depending on intertextuality. Our prior knowledge of the understanding of Philippine lowland culture or highland culture, our prior interactions with Malaysians or non-Malaysians, our prior readings, all right, whether it's the scholarly readings or not, in order to interpret what we see in front of us, right? We can, we, Let's say if our knowledge that we know is so uh, voluminous or so deep that you, you, you challenge the representation of what is shown, all right? because it's inaccurate, it's inauthentic, it's even sensationalist. Right? So where does that kind of critique come from? It comes from outside the frame. Right? If you're, let's say, you're maybe you're an undergraduate student or high school kid who have not uh, very limited intertextual knowledge, intertextual experience, then you tend to believe what is represented to you. Right, you think it is the real, yeah. So I think we we have, we have uh, scholars, uh, researchers, would we know that. Okay, so I'm going to stop this now. So we're going to do to be more interactive. Is Joe? I've asked for six breakout rooms. Right. So the six breakout rooms. We'll be talking about. We'll be showing. We'll be watching those six kinds of documentaries. Yeah. All right, so in the so you have to pull out that slide that I've sent to all of you. There are, according to Bill Nichols, there are six types, six styles of documentary films. Yeah, poetic, expository, observational, participatory, performance, and reflexive. So you'll be now broken up into six breakout rooms. You'll be given twenty minutes. Uh, I've given you the links to those different types uh, of documentaries. So one group, one breakout room will be on just poetic. One breakout room will be just exploratory. So you're not doing all six, you're doing one each. Uh, and the, the examples I've given you in the slides are all feature length documentaries. They're very long, they're like more than 60 minutes. So you don't have to watch 60 minutes because you don't have 60 minutes. I suggest you watch the first five minutes in order to get a sense of the style of the documentary, right? You'll be able to get it, all right, in the first five minutes. And then I've given you additional you note know, in, in the slides how, uh, what are its characteristics. So I want you to discuss just you know, by watching that documentary and then you're again using your intertextual knowledge. You know, uh, do you, are you, in a sense, do you like this kind of documentary? Which, if you watch this kind of documentary, do you find it uh, meaningful, authentic, powerful? Would you show this type of documentary to your students? Okay, get it? It's a very it's sort of open-ended question. It's basically your response to that particular style of ethnographic documentary. Okay, so with that, uh, can we break up now? So in my, my time here, we are in the same time zone. We are 10, 10 here, correct? Or 10, 7. So we come back five, 10, at 10, 30 sharp. Can we break up now, Joe? Friends, colleague. So let's go one by one. Uh, just maybe one minute, two minutes just to share. I know we don't have time to go a full length, uh, full length discussion, but just to give you a taste of the different styles of documentaries uh, outlined by, uh, what's his name now, Bill Nichols. So breakout room number one, can somebody say something? Because I noticed in Stormboard, it's not, people are not writing, so we need to do a verbal one. Uh, oh yeah, the number breakout room number one, uh, the one that group that watched Baraka. 
who was in breakout room one? Mom Jo is in room one. <laughs> yes, Mom Jo. Baraka, tell us about your 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 team's uh, reaction. I, I, I only went there to greet the people. I did not <laughs> participate in the discussion. Do Sorry. you remember? Okay, can you can you summon somebody? You're, not, you're, you're not getting me into this again. <laughs> Yeah, can you summon somebody who is in your group to talk, say something? One minute, Baraka. There's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just your game. Uh, I actually, I, I only remembered one person there. Uh, Doc Rose, are you? I don't, are you listening? Can you give a comment? Uh, Doc Rose is our uh, vice president for academic affairs. Mom Jo, good morning. Good morning, Doc Rose. Madam, yes, please. Uh, <laughs> help me because I failed to get the full instruction. Uh, okay. Sino pa yung kasama mo, Doc Rose? Who who Ma'am Gerdy right? po. Ah, uh, Ma'am Gerdy. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. uh, sa kasino pa sino pa? Engineer Cas po. Ah, baka si Engineer Cass. Okay. Eh, Engineer Cass, attention. Can you say something? Hindi, hindi ko rin po na masyadong na ano yung ano, complete uh, ano po. It's not asking you to say anything about the complete thing because it's really long. But just to give your impressions in terms of visual ethnography. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer. Ma'am, can we share from room 6, sir? Yes, sure, sure. Okay, so, yeah. um, together with Ma Melva, um, from Room Six, po, we have uh, reflexive documentaries, which is "Man with a Movie Camera," which is uh, 1929, composed of 67 minutes by Ziga Vertov. Di ko po alam kung tama yung pagkapronounce ko po. So, uh, for five minutes, uh, the film lends interesting insights the nature of uh, cinema then uh, which is it explains that cinema is something universal then it also means that the camera is the key no eye which includes multiple exposure fast motion slow motion freeze frame extreme close-up uh, in short this uh, documentary film uh, expresses the emotions of uh, employees, workers, even their giving birth, their death. They are documented. And uh, it is also called as constructive re realism, wherein camera could capture real life. And uh, with this, uh, camera is a universal language. So that is all for, for uh, our room six, young man with a movie camera. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, Thank so, you, Paul. Love, Mr. Lin. Yeah, so, yeah, I think you must have got this from Google as well. <laughs> but if you were to watch the documentary, Bertov is a very important filmmaker. He's Russian and he, he pioneered what is called reflexive kind of documentaries, where the documentary filmmakers is part of the storytelling. All right. It's not like a distant kind of ethnographer. This person is part of the storytelling, all right? Uh, and very realist approach. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Now uh, we can move on. So who wanted to volunteer? Maybe two more groups. We don't have time now. Just two more groups. Please volunteer. Good morning, Paul. Yeah. I good morning, Paul, sir, and Mam Jo. So we are uh, I am Melissa Makayan Po. So we are from room room four po room four and I am with Ma'am Judeline Alvarez, Sir Noli Esperas and Ma'am Regine Balmaceda. So we were assigned to watch um, um, documentary, the film about participatory documentaries. Ano po? And uh, we were assigned to watch The Leviathan. So first po is what caught our attention in the five minute video that we watched is this video started with a Bible verse. So the Bible verse is the Job chapter 51, verses 31 to 33. And um, one of our group mates um, searched for this Bible verse and a documentary about this that 
in this documentary, so there is a dispute that um, there is a di dispute that Leviathan means in the Bible it means that this is a large creature underwater, and in the film that we've watched, uh, it is at first you know, it started with a Bible verse about that the Leviathan in the Bible it says that it refers to large creature underwater, and then additional to that is as we watch the video it is in the middle of the ocean and then the waves are based on the waves which is very huge waves uh we think that this video is ano po, uh, they are they are in the middle of the ocean um getting large creature and those large creature it says in the documentary is it can be a whale or crocodile so at first what my idea is about they are they are getting large fish, but according to the documentary that uh, one of our group mates searched for, is it says that there is a dispute that they are getting whale or crocodile in the middle of the ocean. So the title of the documentary is Leviathan because they are getting large creature underwater. So that's all, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, uh, I think this this filmmaker, these two uh, two two persons are from Harvard University. They are anthropologists, uh, so they use I think the Bible verse to capture people's attention, because if you watch the entire documentary, there is no person, there is no interview, there's nothing, right? There's just the sound of the sea and the waves and people catching fish, and you find workers. So this is basically a fishing boat in the North Atlantic. People. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, additional po. Yeah. Uh, can we add? Uh, also, it ano po, It I think because as you said po, there's no one speaking in that in that documentary po. So another observation po that we see is these are ano po. I, just an idea po. Is it an illegal fishing? No, no, it's not. It's not illegal fishing. Yes, sir. No. Uh, okay, po, sir. Thank you po. Yeah. So it's just basically show uh, a typical deep sea trawler all right which also happens in your part of the world right the, the chinese trawling kind of stuff uh so there is no person there's there's no authoritative voice speaking right all you do is it's very immersive right you you get to feel if you like watch what the fishermen do uh throughout this uh film all right there's no, the only sounds you get will be the sound of the sea and sometimes very very free very small part of the film when the men are talking to one another right so it's, it requires a lot of patience to watch this i watched it took me a long time to watch this because this i was hoping for some interpretation no i was hoping for something to tell me what it's about but it's nothing like that okay so uh, i think the word elevation was used to trap us to watch it hoping to see a giant whale or a squid being caught but actually it's all about this man catching fish lots and lots of fish all right so the elevation are those thousands of kilograms of fish okay that's one thing Number two, the technical thing is very interesting, which, which you might want to know, is that this was not used for fashion. They didn't, this thing was filmed, but not using professional camera in, at all. It was just filmed using a GoPro camera. You know, the GoPro camera that you go for tourist stuff, some of you might have that. So you can imagine two anthropologists spending two 20 hour, I think they were working in 20 hour shifts together with the fishermen, just to capture life on the trawling ship with GoPro camera, okay? this is. Uh, so you can so it's possible all right and this film won an award okay so i think uh the, we don't have time to do the rest but just to show you that the different styles done by anthropologists and documentarians yeah uh, and you if, if you're really interested you can go in there so i'm going to pass to rome because, uh, because now we're going to do with the practical part of it all right and this is based on uh, myung's experience and my experience all right over to you myung thank you good morning to all um yeah, just like Daniel here, um, I'm also an amateur um, filmmaker um, in, of docu ethnographic documentaries. And for my session, I would like to start um, sharing one of the videos I made um, years, years back when I was a, still a student um, during my master's in the University of San Carlos. And initially, we, we, our plans is to require our participants to, to make a short video about food culture but uh, considering considering the the technical and logistical difficulties we, we revised our strategy and now we i volunteered as a guinea pig that you criticize the video i made 
and um, towards the end of the video, I'll send you a Google form link and give you five minutes to, to answer the, the specific set of um, points there. Um, the video is intended for the Cebuano Acad Academy audience. So the narration and the language used by the participants during the interviews are in Cebuano or Visaya. Uh, but don't worry, there are English subtitles available. Um, aside from the, the message itself, I want you to also pay attention to the, techni to the technical dimension of the video I'm going to show. So this is a video. Oh, by the way, ma'am, um, I would like to ask the, the technical team here, if it is okay, we could pause the recording during the streaming of this video because I've limited um, the audience to to the classroom and the academy to protect my um, respondents uh, for ethical reasons. I, I'm aware that this is live stream on Facebook. Um, I don't want them to get exposed. The, the topic is going to be touching um, some political leanings because it's going to cover the current development of Cebu, the third bridge, and I'm, I'm documenting the people affected by that infrastructure project. Um, my colleague Daniel has discussed much of the theoretical part of visual ethnography. Um, on my part, we discussed more of the praxis, praxis of um, what we do, uh, what we actually do on the field, or before going to the field and after going to the field, and how we produce and what are the um, uh, several considerations to to consider. Anyway. Um, this is the presentation outline, um, three major points, the pre-production part, the parts to prepare before going to the field, the production part, if you are already there in the field, uh, what will you do? And the post-production part, after you're out from the field and then you're in front of your computer, what are uh, the things you need to do? And lastly, the miscellaneous concerns, I'll be talking about the equipment, the software that you might be needing in order to um, to produce an ethnographic film. Um, I'll be very practical in this approach. And as I said, I can only share um, on the, based on my own personal account of having uh, making this um, amateur experience of filmmaking. So these are, I hope you, this, uh, I hope you also see me as someone that who is a beginner, <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully could, um, could be more relatable for 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 young scholars um in this in this um in this congregation now anyway so the pre-production part uh the first thing you need to do actually is to uh, participate you need to inform all the authorities involved um if the community that you're studying and you're going to make a film is um is an ip or indigenous people you need to ask permission from ncip i mean it has been already uh, discussed on by our previous speakers. Um, I don't I have very limited experience with IP because, like Daniel, I'm also uh, an urban anthropologist, if I could claim. Uh, most of my researches, fieldwork experience, are those with um, informal settlements. So, non IP, we still need to inform the authorities and we need to undergo the proper bureaucratic process. At least, we need to inform um, the city or municipal level with, with the communication letters and also the barangay level. This is very important for our own protection because they need to know what we are doing there in case something bad will happen. Um, the authorities could back us up that they have actually gave us their um, permission. And, and also we need to indicate that we might be record, we will be recording um, audio and um, video files. So that, um, then again, protection. And also the very important, all the time, we need to ask for consent to our respondents. And the gold standard is to, to come up with a consent form here. And we, um, this is a consent form shared by um, Daniel. And we'll try to dissect um, each of the part, um, each of the components of the consent form. It has, to, um, it, has, it has to have this first part, the explanatory statement, you know, that, con that contains a brief background of the research. What is this for? What are the objectives? Uh, what are of what do participants need to expect whenever they give the consent 
And then you need to also explain why, of all the people, why are they chosen to be part of the research? At least this part should be clear. And you should also emphasize that they can volunteer, and that this whole research enterprise is voluntary. They could always withdraw any time. Um, so that this is whatever their choice, whenever they gave their consent, it's not something that we bribe them to do so or force them to do. It should be clear also here. And we need to also be honest to them with the possible risks and benefits of the participants. What they, can they get or what are the possible implications we're in um, if ever something bad will happen. And payment, or I would like to use the terms incentives. What do the participants receive um, if ever they participate in research? Most likely um, they receive tokens in, in form of cash or in kind. Um, depending on the research team, uh, I don't know. I, I think you're planning to having a one big research project. I, I suppose um, you have already decided what to give um, our respondents as as a form of bother's fee. We call it bother's fee for the time that they spent. We need to also give back something, and also we need to ensure that confidentiality that we need to protect their privacy at all times, um, that they would not be identified by any uh, video material that we, we are going to uh, to show. This, this also includes hiding their names. Um, when in our articles, for example, we're going to write using pseudonames um, to protect their identity, especially if you're dwelling in more sensitive topics such as political leanings or um, sensitive issues. And also storage of data, you need to ensure that it's only up to your office or wherever you're going to store your data. And the results, you need to also guarantee them that you go, uh, we need to share um, the video materials, the final research paper, even the raw materials we need to show, or better off, uh, which I will discuss later on, um, you, you might watch them together in the community and then they could see their faces on the screen. And that would be a good experience also for anthropologists. Um, yeah, for complaints, you need to assure them in case of very bad happen, they know where, who to contact, who to, who to address um, their complaints. Uh, this should be part and parcel of the, all of these elements should be part and parcel of the consent form. Um, and yeah, the, the second part of consent form is where the participants would check. Would check um, which activities um, are they giving their, their right to, to be part of the research? Did they agree with like taking um, photos or um, using the material for our publication, uh, information dissemination materials, all of the stuff? Um, it, it depends, it varies on the project. And you also need to, you as an, inter as an interviewer, you need to sign and you need to provide the contact details and also, most important part, if there's no signature of the respondent, then do not proceed of interviewing that person. <laughs> and very important also, um, you must translate um, the consent form in a language that is understood by the respondent. And you need to explain it to them in, in a manner that is uh, comprehensible at their level. And secure at least two copies, one for you and one for the respondent. This is part of the transparency of the consent form. This is the gold standard uh, whenever uh, we, we conduct. But this is, um, you know, this is very rigid and strict. Um, I know many um, anthropologists would try to approach this, um, uh, this procedure um, in their own creative ways, but um, it depends case to case basis and depending, but for our protection, we need to undergo the proper consenting process. And a last part of the pre-production, we need to identify our field guides. It is very important on uh, the field guide, especially if it is your first encounter with the community. You need to know, you need to have someone to go with you and to introduce you to the community so that um, the community that you're going to study will, uh, you know, will re re earn the trust. Normally it's, it's a barangay tunnel just like this one. Uh, actually this, I, I've been, uh, at this picture, it's been already like three years doing ethnographic work. Um, I just need the assistance of the tunnel because I'm bringing my classmates and my professor on the field. So it's my power is not enough to protect them <laughs> from whatever um, elements. But yeah, um, the, usually field guides could be a barangay tunnel. It could be a barangay health worker or BHW 
or it could be a friend or a community. Just make it sure that that person that you identified as a field guide don't have a notorious reputation on the community. Otherwise, it will compromise um, the way you establish your rapport on, um, on the field. And yes, this is very important and it stresses out. Avoid choosing politicians as, as field guide because um, the community will accuse you for ulterior motives and they might expect something from you that they may give you and then all the programs. I, mean, I think you know what I mean here. Now, um, the second part, then the production part, um, now you're there on the field, uh, what do you need to do? Um, you, you have your cameras with you. And now I think there's our sets of tips I'm just going to show you. Um, first, you need to identify the key informants and the key informants should be uh, credible. I think this has been tackled by our previous speakers. And also the, the very important, the presence of a camera, especially if you're bringing a, a large DSLR or the sophisticated tools, you have to remember it has a corresponding effect to your respondents, both advantageous, both, or, or it could be adverse. Sometimes they could be um, letting their guard up because you have a camera with you. Sometimes uh, some of them are very, let's say, artista feeling. <laughs> you know those people, um, whenever there's a reporter and then magkaway kaway sa likod. We, we also have those types of respondents and um, there's a give and take when you are exposing big cameras on the field. So um, uh, what I do, um, my best advice is do not take anything at the first encounter unless it is something very interesting because we need to verify first um, what is really going on on the field. Um, the, the, the footages I took in the field is not something I, I took in a single day. These are products of like intermittent visits or um, immersion and uh, until I have, I have uncovered the story. And it's not really um, on the first day it's not, it's not practical to, to immediately get the photo of all of this stuff on the first day. And um, yeah, if the respondents express any discomfort or being filmed, offer him the options. Like, um, for example, it's not, he says, no, I don't want my face to be seen. There are uh, different tips to that. I think you're familiar with how our journalists would interview rape victims, for example. Um, they, they have it against the light so that uh, we can only see a silhouette of the, of the interviewee. Or sometimes it could go censored um, during the edit editing uh, process. Or we can let them wait or wear a mask or anything that will not um, identify them. And um, also very important, which is I, I committed a lot of mistakes in my previous documentary film because it's very challenging. Um, look for a place where there's a least disturbance. I say least disturbance. It's very challenging in informal settings because it's so congested. that there's a lot of people, babies crying. You, yeah, you see there a lot of boosters, um, chickens, uh, people passing by. Um, but it just, just trust your gut feeling. <laughs> where is the best place to interview people? Um, in my case, I found the house of the respondent which is relatively um, uncrowded compared to other places in, in Pasil where I conducted research. And just identify that place. And choose the area with good lighting. And especially if you don't have sophisticated tools, you rely more on um, natural light. And by practice, we, we photographers and even um, videographers have this thing called golden hour. The golden hour is like one hour, one hour to two hours after sunrise and or one, one to two hours to one hour before sunset. Um, du during this golden hour, the natural light will, will bring out your inner glow of, the pe of people, especially if you're, you're really into portraits and then try to document people. Um, natural light is best during the golden hours before, uh, after sunset, after sunrise and before sunset. And if possible, secure a microphone or lapel, which I, I did not do. I failed miserably in this part. I don't have a microphone uh, um, for better pickup on the audio, especially for interviews, because it will really ruin the experience of the audience whenever the audio quality is bad. And 
also for stability for video stability is, is it's best practice that you bring a tripod or you place a camera somewhere do not rely on your hand just um holding the camera because your our arms are not a stable base to hold our devices you need to have something that will um that will guarantee no shaking or i think you know what i mean here and yeah um just basics on video um i think i have to i have to make the client line here clear the default video orientation will always be landscape in documentary film it's never portrait i know tiktok is popular and all other pop social media platform but um we expect documentary films to be viewed on the wide screen on theaters or uh, or the silver screen it should be a landscape we can never invert the screen on the movies and the portrait i know is popular now because we cannot go out and most of our um entertainment we get from our phones even right now so but best practice by default do it landscape because it gives it allows more uh, visual data uh, with that part of with that orientation and be aware of proper framing and just gonna teach you the basics here <laughs> like for example the ceiling you have some little bit of space between the head and the frame of the video at least do not um do not sever the <laughs> the face of the person i mean these are these are things na, that is uh, basic on inter in interview framing and also the best uh, for interviews best is half body shots so it's between the chest and the head um full body is not really good for you know interviews half body is bad and space is very important um and this is intentional uh, i know and we have different styles but for interviews in my case i never put the interviewee on the center uh, of the object of the frame because i want to also give the audience uh, some clues on what type of environment they're in and space um, there are also a lot several other techniques on um, using space as conveying a message for example um, the looking space for example if you want to emphasize that the person is looking at a certain object um, you need to allot some space there's also moving space um, to indicate movement from one place to another uh, I, I believe you you can be you can search more of these techniques um, but I'm, I'm not going to dwell with that but i'm just showing you some basics um also um when you're in the field you need to take advantage of special events like weddings and annual ritual other festivities for example in my case which um i did not show in the video there's the Tuslubua festival so um the respondent told me sir you'd be here because we have a festival going on um uh, you need to, to go and strike the when the iron is hot it doesn't happen every time and whenever your respondents are inviting you for birthdays or uh, other special event it means to say that they are comfortable with you already and they have established your rapport and um, in my case when we back when i had the access to go to the field i really cancel all of my schedules uh, for so that i can document this rare um, opportunity so you have to take advantage of that whenever your respondents are inviting you to attend something but in case you failed to, to attend a very important event or a very important activity you wish to document you can always recreate with a consent with your respondents just like in this case for example um going to the sea and then witnessing them how um, they fish for fish and fish for metal scraps um is something that we agreed on because i'm really interested um they, they kept on mentioning it that they've been doing it for several years already I just haven't really got a chance because of all of my other responsibilities, but I had to set a date for them and uh, they were very willing to comply and I'm very thankful that uh, for that experience. Um, you can always recreate something, especially if you want to document food, for example, you want to interview a certain local chef. You can you can spend a day with him or her um, from buying the ingredients in the market to cooking it to eating. These are um, several of the suggestions I'm trying to tell. It's partly staged, but it's actually ethnographic data still. Um, yeah, think of possible filler shots. Um, do not, do, when you're going in the field, even one second 
two seconds, three seconds of video, these are very helpful. Pillar shots are something like anything, anything that gives clue of whatever community you're, um, you're studying. Uh, it could be like the, their environment or any form of activity. It could be their body parts, for example, if they are uncomfortable, you want to show a shaking hand during the video. Because if you're just going to show a video of the interviewee talking about several things, it would be boring for the audience. That's why it's, it would be um, during the editing process, you need to insert some of these filler shots so that um, the audience would, would, would understand what this interviewee is talking about. For example, if he's talking about his facing practices, you need to show filler shots of this teaching. Um, you need to overlap uh, videos during the editing process. This is what I mean to say about filler shots. Do not be contented that ah, I've already done my interview video, recorded my video here. Not, no, you need to take uh, all possible visual that you find interesting in the field and take as many shots as possible. Explore different angles. In this case, for example, here, um, this is this is an ang this is a footage I I, I I shot while I'm almost lying down on the boat. <laughs> this is not something you can get in an ordinary standing alone or sitting in in the boat. Uh, if you if you've noticed, um, if you're attending weddings and there are same day edit videographers, sometimes they are so funny um, posting different uh, positions and. <clears throat> It's actually true. You need to you need to flex or um, be flexible. You need to stretch all those muscles. Now, sometimes they, they lie down on the ground. Sometimes we do that. It's funny sometimes, but you can get the best angles if you do it. And it actually brings out some opportunity that people in the field will actually be uh, hanging out with you because sometimes they want to imitate you in a certain way. And yeah, I think it's working well with what I'm doing. Um, and also in interesting shots, for example, here I see a um, almost dying fish, but still moving. Oh, these, are, these, are, these are shots that will keep the audience awake. Um, and yeah, do not use built-in filters. I know uh, we are all familiar with Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram, and all these um, filters. Do not do that on the field. Just collect as many data as you, as many photographs or many video materials as you want because it will consume so much of your time if you're doing your editing on the field, you do it afterwards. And yeah, I think the last thing, even if it's not really directly related to the current uh, research topic you're undergoing, but as long as you've seen something interesting um, on, on field work, you take the opportunity to record it just, just as a proper consent lang. Like for example, in this one, it, um, it astounded me so much, this practice of the lead tag because despite all of other available source um, uh, methods to kill a rat, burning, poisoning them, they use this very uh, <laughs> ingenious way of drowning the rat in a cage and then having the humba or the food, the sport dish as a bait for the rat. And there's, it, it shows something psychologically about the respondents, a certain type of sadomasochism, I don't know, uh, <laughs> with this type. And then he, this, um, respondents, the last surviving um, ship um, boat builder. I, it's not really part of my research focus at that moment, but I just need to document that for future purposes. Because as I think Mam Suyan has said, whenever you're on the field, there's no actually focus on what you're going to study. Sometimes you find something interesting and um, that can trigger any light bulb moment whenever you're conducting ethnographic field work. And as much as possible, just with all due diligence and do the consenting thing and uh, assure them that they will be protected and document it as much as you can, as much as possible, because you have very limited time in the field. And then now, um, post-production. Um, the post-production part, um, many would be, I know, uh, a lot of people would say now, uh, I don't know how to make a documentary film because I'm not that familiar with documentary um, editing softwares and all of this stuff. Um, it's not actually the main thing about documentary film. It's more of like a storyboarding or a screenwriting on how you arrange different screen, uh, different scenes uh, to convey a very coherent story. And sometimes I do something like this by scratch. Sometimes I draw, 
scene one is this, scene two is this. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, my handwriting is bad, but yeah, sometimes I do like that. <laughs> so before I, I start um, making the film and consider who is the immediate audience uh, for the, the video I showed you, um, it's the, the audience I have in mind is the Philippine, um, the Cebuano um, audience who are in the academy, um, uh, academic setting. Uh, that's why I, I made it all Cebuano, narrations in Cebuano, um, because it was all Cebuano. But um, if ever I'm going to um, show it for some other audience, I could probably um, adjust. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's this part of it. Uh, which part should be public? Which should part to be you know limited to a small audience? You need to consider your audience so that you can write a very good story or screenwriting in in in, in the post production process. And also expect that you have that not all of the footages or that will you can use in in making in the editing process uh, for example in my in one of my documentary films i i i made last 2015 about lubua or a, a dish in in a Cebuano dish uh, a poor man's food um i had around three hours worth of video footages but i only the final um, output is only 13 minutes. So it requires a careful, critical <laughs> selection of, of these scenes. You don't need to dump everything and then uh, pretend that you're actually telling a message there. You need to, it requires so much brain work to, to carefully select which scene um, accurately convey the message that you want to, um, you want to say. So this is a very important consideration when you start editing videos. And do not think that editing videos is uh, an, you know, it's a walk in the park. It's You need to dedicate long hours of sitting in front of your computer screen <laughs> and sometimes days, um, because especially if you are really keen into details and you, don't, you want to eliminate anything that will disturb the audience, like um, those one, two, three at the beginning of the shooting, <laughs> for example, or all those um, shaking or someone is passing by or our behind the scene um, moments, you need to delete all of the stuff because it's disturbing the audience. And also you need to budget your time. Uh, aside from the editing process per se, um, the rendering component of making a VM is actually <laughs> um, gonna test your patience. It will take hours, but it depends on your editing software. Um, sometimes it would take days, depending on the length of your video you're rendering. The rendering process will take so much time and it will actually demand um, higher spec uh, specifications of your devices. And okay, um, um, you also need to edit video materials, which are difficult to, to watch. For example, if it's too dark, you can adjust the brightness. You, that's why when I said in the production part, do not do any editing of your raw materials. You do it when you are on the post-production stage because it's only there that you have all the time to adjust or to crop which, uh, which part of the videos you want to show or to zoom in and out um, or to cut unnecessary disturbing parts of the video. You do it on the post-production phase. Do not do it on the field. And here, okay, music, which I did a very terrible job to be honest. <laughs> Uh, it, it enhances uh, the viewer's experience, but you need to choose the appropriate music. And, and what I've showed you, I've just selected random Cebuano um, homegrown music instrumentals, which I, which I believe would promote the Cebuano identity. That's what, that's what was on my mind at that time. But um, you need to also, I need to also be familiar. No, uh, we all, I think we need to also be familiar with all the copyright issues if, whenever we use a certain song from an artist or uh you need to or we can use royalty fee music and youtube granted that we we will cite them in our credit section so that we can uh we can avoid um any lawsuit coming from us and uh, uh what what else um if you plan to yeah if you plan to compete in an ethnographic film festival i think sir daniel um knows much about it i haven't uh, submitted yet any entry to 
films, but maybe in the future. Um, it's better that you have original compositions uh, for music so that you will not be disqualified by the guidelines of ethnographic film festivals. And also in the credit section, um, you need to acknowledge all the cast, staff, music, funder, institution. But um, yeah, we, we haven't really uh, gone to the end. But most of the time, um, I haven't really got, I'm, I don't have the privilege yet to have a staff with me to work on documentary films. I made around four documentary films so far, but all of which are one-man team. Um, I'm saying it's possible. Any one of us here, it's possible that we can make a documentary film as long as we have the proper mindset and uh, the technical know the basic technical know-how of producing one. Um, you just have to acknowledge everyone who have the cast, his, uh, who are the people you interviewed, who are the people um, who have granted you access to the field who are the people or the institutions that made you, gave you this opportunity um, to funded you. And then regarding, um, also you can also put for the protection of, for your protection and the protection of your respondents, um, this all rights preserved or the viewer's advisory, uh, you need to indicate that case in case um, someone will use your video for other purposes. For example, my Tuslubuwa video, for example, a certain Tuslubuwa store, um, use my video to promote your products without my consent. These are things that we need to be careful about. And after that experience, I always put all rights reserved and all these advisory things because um, some people might uh, might take advantage of our hard work um, uh, in producing films. And regarding that, short documentaries um, are those anything below 30 minutes, while featured documentaries are those that last more than 60 minutes or one hour. Um, which you have a glimpse um, a while ago on uh, the breakout sessions. And lastly, in the post-production process, you need to know the audience. I think it would be also nice um, that you also give back to the community that um, that's the source that made this um, video possible. And like in my case, we had a film viewing with the community and then I saw them. They're so happy that they're seeing their faces <laughs> on the film. And it's actually a good experience. I, I mean, a uh, heartwarming experience, I, I which I really hope that um, um, some of you will, will undergo. Um, you may also give them a photo album or the raw files of the research. I mean, it's, it's, it's their faces. And I think they have the right to do it. And yeah, I think you need also to give back. And especially if you can give them a copy of your research paper, for example, or whatever output you have come up. And yeah, uh, miscellaneous almost done here. Um, miscellaneous concerns. Ideally, if you have the most powerful camera in the world, then yeah, best use it. <laughs> um, the more, the higher the resolution of your camera, whether it's high definition or 4K, use it. However, um, if you don't, if you're not that economically affluent, you can use smartphones. I mean, the video I showed you, I'm only using my smartphone, except for the GoPro part, uh, if it, I need to go underwater. Uh, yeah, um, I think most of the videos, all I think all of the videos so far are primarily shot by I, um, my smartphone. My smartphone, that some, I'm using a Samsung S7 at that time. Um, yeah, uh, smartphones now have powerful cameras that could be at par with the most powerful cameras a decade ago. And I think it's enough, I mean, it should not be a reason, the, the lack of technology, technology should not be a reason why we could not produce films, and especially now that it's, um, it's all prevalent. And this, is a, and this is a technical advice. If you are really into this, you need to invest much on technology, like use a computer or a laptop with at least eight GB RAM or two GB video RAM because if you don't want to stress out and ruin your day because you haven't produced your video as smooth as it is, yeah, just just use the most um, at least the power a powerful laptop so that so that you can create videos with ease. And by principle, the higher the video resolution, the higher grade of specs needed. So, if your video material is very it's 4K, especially if you're using drone, for example, or other more sophisticated tools. Um, do not expect that the processing process, the processing of that or the rendering process of the video will go on smoothly. It takes much time. The, the, the higher the file 
and make it sure that you have enough memory space and battery power before going to the field. In my case, if I go to the field, I always bring two power banks with me, <laughs> just in case. Um, I even bring every time an extension wire <laughs> when I go to the field because um, getting uh, video material is essential to the things I do. I mean, I really love um, doing all this stuff. So I need to be prepared and uh, preparing um, enough energy uh, for my tools to keep going is an essential. And for edit, uh, video editing software, choose which is most accessible to you. Um, on, the, on the logos, I shown you below i'm only familiar with with um, adobe premiere pro vegas and dsdc and i'm not familiar with filmora but i need to mention this because it's getting popular so i haven't get my hands on it uh, most professionals would use adobe premiere pro the downside is um, it takes um, and you need to pay to get the license and it also requires so much um, specs so it's expensive uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. But the best thing about Adobe Premiere Pro is you can manipulate any raw material on the editing process. If you really want it crisp and in with full details, Adobe Premiere Pro, I, uh, in my opinion, is the best software out there. So Sony Vegas with, I mean, second to Adobe Premiere Pro. How about the one, one other downside of Adobe Premiere Pro? It takes so long to render. Um, if you are an amateur like me, VSDC, I think, is the most decent open source video editor out there. You can only download this anytime. The only problem I have with VSDC is that I cannot manipulate the cutting, um, the, you know, I mean, precisely manipulate the, the cutting of the videos or the editing part of which. Um, limited, limited, ang, ano, limited uh, features dito, the, the VSDC if you want to increase the brightness, but there's a way to do it, but you need to undergo so many clicks compared to when, compared to your work around in Adobe Premiere Pro. But um, this is best for you, to left to you to explore. I mean, there's a lot of tutorial videos out there on how to use these tools. Um, the most important thing is you have this type of imagination wherein you can imagine scenes like reels in your mind, and then you can arrange them. All together, yes, I think uh, which going to my last slide. Now, making an ethnographic film is a highly visual and intuitive activity. Uh, it, it requires dedication to hone an imagination that appreciates people um, and communities the way they are. And filmmaking, like any art form, is a combination of form or the execution or the production value. I'm talking about the quality of the video, the audio quality. These are important things to consider. And also the concept, the content or the concept or the message that you're trying to convey is also um, part and parcel to make um, a ethnographic film uh, beautiful in its way. And always put in mind that the safety of our privacy of our and the privacy of our communities we study are paramount. These are the most important thing to consider. Because our motivation in making film should not be the one of sensationalization, just like what PMGS are doing, for example, that there are service of romanticizing poverty and all other human atrocities. But anyway, but we need to objectively tell the story of humanity in the most humane and effective medium as much as possible. And I think um, this is where I see uh, the most practical um, uh, component of um, visual ethnography, I would say. So um, I end my. <laughs> My presentation here. So I hope you learned something today. Thank you very much. who have shared their very interesting discussion for this morning. So I guess, ma'am, we're now going to have with the, <clears throat> to proceed with the question and answer portion, the open forum. So we are um, encouraging our participants to just type in their questions through the chat box. If you have some clarifications or some questions that you want to address to our resource speakers for this morning, 
you may now do so. Thank you. So, I mean, um, Jocelyn, while waiting, while waiting, waiting for them to, the uh, while waiting yeah, for them ahead. to check the question, can I just share one? Yes, sir. So you see this, um, assuming that you have a smartphone, which I believe all of you would have. So I found this now been uh, on sale. It's the Vlogger kit by a professional company called Roder, but I'm sure you can find cheaper versions in the Philippines, right? So this, this complete set here, you can use your smartphone. You need to invest in a good tripod, which can convert in, uh, well, basically tripod that can hold LED light for night shots and the microphone. Right, so uh, on the online, I checked it was about 120 to 130 US dollars, right? If you want to self finance, but I'm sure with this project to uh, to do IP studies and all that, and if you want to do visual, I'm sure the department under Mom Joe will be able to buy the more expensive uh, equipment, right? Uh, core equipment to do that kind of work, yeah. But if let's say you want to do it yourself, this is all you need about 120 130 US, Roder, the professional one. But I'm sure there must be uh, cheaper versions in the Philippines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, sir, for the sharing. Po. So I guess we have one question po, coming from our chat box. So the question is coming from Dr. Corazon Espajardo. Po one of the participants from the College of Business and Public Administration. So good morning po. How about if we are going to use the social media as sources of data? To whom will we seek for permission to get samples of pictures? Because the social media provides us a lot of pictures and videos. Okay, so maybe I'll start first. Uh, I have I have uh, supervised PhD, PhD students who do analysis of social media. So the key, the, the general principle, if it is open, if it's in social media, it's an open platform, and you are just uh, analyzing in general, you don't need permission, yeah, because it is there in open, it's an open public forum kind of stuff. But if my PhD student is monitoring certain Facebook uh websites or certain bloggers then we our, our university requires us to write to them these people whom you are studying as case studies to let them know that we are stalking them a, a sort academically stalking them yeah so it's like by matter of courtesy so it is uh, it's a very uh, delicate line yeah in terms of research yeah mm. yeah i think um i resonant uh, my resentments resonates to what Daniel said. I just want to point out that um, sometimes we don't. I'm I'm more concerned with the epistemological um, implications of using social media as the only source of data. I think we also need to exert effort to validate whatever we see online because we don't really know the full story. So um, if if we have access um, to verify who are these people, uh, for example. Um, my respondents in um, in the informal settlements are also my friends in Facebook. In a way, I can also communicate, inter, um, interact with them. But I always ask whenever they post something. I always have to communicate to them. What are you doing here? Because I just cannot speculate my own level. We need to really verify it from the respondents themselves. So um, um, aside from gaining permission, I think we also need to verify. The validity of our data whenever we get it primarily online yeah i think we all know that uh, social media there are very few they're very very rarely they're original materials right they are forwarded from somewhere else yeah so again uh, I, I don't know what's the real research question about this are you, you are you tracking a particular so-called video a viral video uh, so you want to do a data analytics about that viral video uh, you want to do a content you want to do a discursive analysis about the content of the video right so it depends on the purpose right um, of uh, what kind of visual data that you're harvesting yeah so normally people who will do uh, let's say uh, social media tracking they use big data analytics it's, it's not so much the the video itself it's about who gets who shares with what okay? so that's a different kind of analysis very quantitative but if you want doing an ethnographic or digital ethnography, uh, then there has to be a more qualitative 
uh, analysis. So the qualitative analysis is about the, con the, the video itself, the visual itself, okay? What is the message it is um, trying to convey? And, and, and just as important, the comment section, right? The comment section that shows the kind of debate it is generating. So that one is qualitative, yeah? So, but uh, I see the question is about getting permission, right? So again, I repeat what I just said, right? Public forum, public play, uh, space, generally you, you can't, you don't need to because you don't know the source the actual source, yeah? But if you are monitoring a certain celebrity blogger, uh, I think it's considered courtesy to, to let this person know that you're quote unquote stalking him or her and that it will become part of your publication later on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, most of the questions in terms of ethics will be answered on Monday. Um, we have a session on Monday starting nine o'clock but again the preliminaries would be 8 45 and before that your, your registration anyway uh anything that is on public domain as general rule is public you know it means that you don't have ask any permission i have to defend my uh my field work again uh in malaysia and singapore uh mainly because they were concerned about the public domain aspect of my research and taking documentary shots of filipino migrants but my defense is always this it is a public domain they chose to go to that public domain and therefore so long as i don't identify anyone in the picture and zero zero in on anyone in the picture it is all right to take pictures no? that is that you are covered by that because you argue that religion is always something public if they want to go in secret then that's their uh, that's their prerogative but anyone who going to a public domain should be prepared to be identified as part of that public domain. Thank you. All right. So to because time is short, so I see a second question. I, Neil and I can answer this. I think we dealt this in the, my lecture uh, again. All right. Uh, this is depending on the kind of style of documentary you are a disciple of. The purists among us will say no, no such thing as reenactment. You can only film what actually happens in front of your eyes. All right. To capture the authentic moment. Uh, but there are some who say, uh, as, as long as you're not getting actors, right? Uh, and they just, you, you just want them to re do, sort of do the ritual again, or do the ceremony again for the purpose of documentation. Some, the non purists will say it's not a problem, right? They, it's, they, they themselves still acting out the event. Yeah, it's, they're performing uh, their event. So it depends on which school of thought you are. Are you a purist or non purist? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm a non purist in on, on, on that dichotomy then. <laughs> um it's just the, yeah, as say um Daniel said, um, you know, it we see in a TV that black and white flashback or reenactment, it's different from the reenactment we do in ethnographic films because the actors themselves are the respondents themselves, those coming from the community. And that's that gives you know authenticity a certain degree compared to uh, what we usually see and reenacted in like MMK, for example, reenactment. <laughs> it's different in the reenact reenactment as we understand in um, visual ethnography. Yeah. And okay, of course, again, it depends what is the reenactment uh, about, right? You're not going to ask them to reenact, let's say, a killing, <laughs> a slaughter of uh, of an animal in with blood and the kind of stuff, all right? Because I'm sure the, uh, they are so-called censor, censorship about that in the Philippines as they are in Malaysia, yeah. So what, what is it that they're reenacting, okay? Again, so we have to use our sensibility, yeah? Our visual sensibility about this, yeah. Like for example, like uh, I think I've been, uh, not, not reenactment, but real, real happenings, all right? I've been following uh, uh, pics. <laughs> The slaughter of pigs in the Cordillera for ritual reasons. So I have a lot of visuals of pigs screaming away while they're being killed. All right. So I mean, I'm documenting this, but there's no way I'm going to put into my documentary. Okay. Because I don't want to give the wrong impressions. Yeah. To the viewers. All right. So it's, I'm, I'm documenting it, but it's not going to be in my documentary. Yeah. I'm also a non purist, but uh, I do uh, admit that. There's some use in the reenactment, you know, just to explain every part to uh, the people. I've watched one, uh, you know, student, you know, production of University of San Carlos, especially regarding the funeral practices of lowlanders, you know, of the Philippines, you know. And that's one thing that I, that's one that I show to my students on how to do uh, reenacted, uh, you know, ethnography uh, in my classes at De La Salle University. Uh, so, 
that actually is very good when you are trying to explain every part, okay? Uh, for example, the ritual, especially when you're going through the burial ritual of lowland Filipinos. So may part, there is a part there na pumunta sa silong ng kabao, uh, the people go, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, under the coffin, and there's a narrator explaining that practice. Then, you know, there's some part that were in a chick, you know, one chick is placed uh, in the coffin. And again, there's a narrator explaining, you know, especially the interview of the woman explaining the importance of the chick in the, in the coffin. So reenactment uh, helps when uh, you are in a class trying to explain or you are trying to explain to an audience the different parts of one whole ritual or one whole belief. That helps. But when you're doing a, a real life, live, you know, ritual, uh, as I did in the Sinulog of uh, practice of the Filipinos in New Zealand, then I had to explain again in part, every part, but it is not reenacted because, you know, my documentation was as it, as it happened, you know, I was taking footages of the uh, ritual itself. But in the write up, I took particular pictures of every part to explain certain things about the ritual. So within the video that I'm taking, uh, it happened, no? As as is, you know, in the ritual, uh, no reenactment. But in the footages, uh, the footages and the explanation are actually reenactments, no? Because I am explaining certain things. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to share something in chat, but somehow the chat is disabled now. So well, the chat has been able. So there's also a new development uh, in so-called uh, documentary filmmaking uh, in, in the West, and I'm sure it's going, going to be copied by people here as well. Sometimes you don't have to get real people to reenact. If you have graphic artists among you, you make this into a cartoon, a comic, right? To hide faces, right? To, to hide the anonymity of it. So if I can have the check function, so okay, anyway, you can check it out. So there's this group called Positive Negatives uh, based in London. This is a group uh, an NGO uh, uh, run by academicians, anthropologists and all that who works on refugees and migrant workers around the world. So they, 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 they transform the ethnographic data into cartoons and comics. So that it becomes accessible to school children. No, so they're basically using ethnographic data to, uh, to, to educate. Yeah? So they don't have to rely on actual shots, right? They, they transform this into visual. Right? And the thing about cartoons and comics is you're already hiding identity when you do that. So that is a new development in doing what's called sensitive, uh, sensitive visual ethnography. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's called positive negatives. Yeah. Dot org. So maybe while waiting for question, I will just say, okay, uh, the reason why I really took took up to be honest the why i took up learning to do video uh, videos and all that kind of stuff is not because i wanted to do research i wanted to document my own family all right so this is where you can practice your own family all right birthdays all right so i'm every time there's a birthday i do a birthday video with messages from the family uh when there's ever an anniversary and sometimes when there are funerals so you can use your own family because I, I realized I've been doing this for 20 years. So I have 20 years of visual archive of my family's development, all right? From babies being born to children growing up, education, blah, blah, blah. And you can practice doing your, you know, your camera work, your editing work uh, on your family, all right? Making food, that kind of stuff. Then when, it, uh, then when you actually have to do research, then you become more uh, adept, you know, in the sense that what Myung is talking about, you, you become very familiar with your equipment. You don't have to think twice anymore. You know what to do automatically. You become much more intuitive. You can anticipate movements and all that kind of stuff, right? So you don't have to wait for that so-called big moment, right, to win your Oscar award. You can start already with your own family or friends, okay? Um, Which is a nice thing to share now, um, how we be, why we got into this. Um, I learned filmmaking way back in high school, even way, way years before um, learning um, anthropology. Um, I, I'm into, into ethnographic film now because I hate this time limit during the conferences. <laughs> we have 15 minutes and I'm so talkative, I cannot finish all, the entire entirety of my presentation. So why might, why might as well create a documentary video that fits 15 minutes and I don't have to talk much. So that's that's uh, that's the maybe the wrong inspiration, but yeah, 
that motivated me to create films to be honest but but from that experience uh, i guess it's there's a growing interest um you know to uh, to use this particular uh, skill um in disseminating anthropological data in a certain way which i believe if you are you know a multimedia guy who thinks in images and maybe visual anthropology would be a thing for you i, I highly encourage it Maybe we draw in Amelia because Amelia shared that she's a documentary filmmaker. Maybe you have some experiences. What's the wisdom that you have? Uh, want to share, Amelia, if you're still uh, still in the call? Mom, Amelia? I see her on that, but she's maybe she, oh, okay, she's switching on already. Oh, she's gone again. No question. So, okay. So I just, in the chat. Uh, is she there, Amelia? Yeah. Can we use old pictures in our documentation long time ago for filming to update our research now for ethnography? You mean something you took photograph and film long time ago and you make a documentary now? Is that what you mean? I think no? that's what it means. Yeah. Uh, you mean you film it long time ago or you shot the photographs and now you make in the year 2021, a documentary of what happened in the year 1995. Is that uh, yes, saying? because uh, it says here that they use it for documentation long time ago, meaning, meaning to say that it was just for the purpose. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I did. In fact, I don't make my documentaries within one year, two years. Some of my documentaries, like five years, 10 years ago, are shot. So I put the context in my text, my titles in the beginning, that this something happened that. So for example, like now I'm, uh, I'm spending my, I'm going to spend the next few months after I finish my administrative duties to, uh, to edit my, uh, what is that festival in uh, Ilo Ilo? I forget already. What's it called? The big festival. Dinagyang. Ah, the Dinagyang. Dinagyang. So I filmed the Dinagyang from behind the scene of a, a particular dance troupe that won the medal, that won first prize. So I've been, I spent a few days doing, you know, the preparation so i want to tell that story now all right it's behind the scene of the performances so it's like it was filmed in 2015 and i still <laughs> haven't finished editing it yet because yeah. i'm i'm trying to figure out the whole if you like the visuals of it okay anyway amelia is on all right amelia you want to share a bit of your experience yeah and words of wisdom you're muted mom you're muted uh, no sound Well, sound. i need there's no sound, Ami. Yeah, because I, I want to invite her in because she is a woman. So is there a gender dimension in filmmaking? Uh, hopefully, mm, you will bring that up. Daniel, there is always a gender dimension. I know. Him. That's why I want Mama <laughs> Amelia to bring it up. Are there, are there some things that women can I would like to emphasize better? that. There's always a gender dimension in everything. <laughs> yeah. Where is Mom Amelia? Okay, we're waiting for her. Uh, maybe I'll just bring one simple point. Or I, I don't speak fluent Tagalog. All right, the people I do work with are, are Ilocano speaking. I don't understand Kankanai. So uh, I have a very interesting filmmaking experience. All right? I depend a lot on my RAs. And after only is translated, I understand what is going on. That's why it takes me a long time to make documentaries on Filipino uh, research subjects. All right, the language problem is very, very important. If you don't understand, then it's a bit, okay, Amelia is coming in again. Yeah. So I'm a bit hesitant to make like 24 hours, 48 hours documentaries, unlike Myung, right? Because he's already immersed in the context. I'm speaking as an outsider. Yeah. All right, Mom Emilia, you want to share? Go ahead, Ami. Go ahead, Ami. We got disconnect. Anyway, uh, done making joint uh, documentary film, uh, doc documentary film outfits. Like I did short films with National Geographic. Mm. Uh, for Tasaday and the last tribes of Mindanao, I'd done my own independent film documentaries, uh, doing uh, feature films for a, a production company on seafarers, Filipino seafarers. I've also done documentaries for on short notices from foreign companies like an Irish company who did the documentary on decoding Christianity. And it's, uh, it's one challenging documentary where they just fly over. Uh, you go to Pampanga because they were going to do a documentary on the crucifixion, the human, uh, the human uh, crucifixion during Lenten season. I'm sure you have seen that. 
and um, and if you are not familiar, you are not familiar with uh, 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 Philippine culture. It's so difficult to look for. Uh, it's a one week uh, filmmaking, so you you shoot from the day from the that from Sunday to the day of uh, the resurrection. So how do you you fill in? Uh, how do you f get the footages to shoot, given a script, a ready script? And uh, and the only way that was made possible because you had a very good research team in Pampanga who were trained in anthropology, who are also from the place. And then I had a very good taxi driver who, who <laughs> drove around for one day looking for the location. And then next day, it's a shoot. So that's one very difficult, but very challenging documentary. And the, 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 what happened was, the film was not followed, the, the script was not followed because it didn't fit the culture. And, and there were opportunities that were there, rare opportunities that they wouldn't have captured if they, they focus on the script. Because uh, it just went, it was flawless. And the communities participated. And we found a new community where they were in crucifixion. had it for some reason. So, um, but sadly, the documentary hasn't reached the Philippines. It has stayed in Canada. And I'm still trying to get a copy up to now, but I have some raw footage with me because we did the translation as well. So the translation is quite a challenge, especially if you don't know the language. So you ha I have to look for an Negrito who talks Kapampangan. And, uh, and he, he was the one who helped me. Uh, complete the translation for the prayers. And I hope you, I'll give you the link to that. It's Decoding oh, Christianity. You. And so, it's one very good documentary, I would say. Yeah. So, they have won awards. Mm. So mom, I just want to clarify, are you a producer or you are you hold a camera yourself? You, are I you hold a director? camera. Uh, uh, I hold the camera. I have two cameras, but, uh, and usually they take, uh, usually production houses take me in. Uh, to do the research, the pre-fraud. Okay. Uh, I am the researcher. I am the one who look for all locations. Right, right. I look for the characters. I uh, since I'm an anthropologist, so uh, I basically try like like I did one for EDSA Revolution. Wow. Okay. And I, they took me to do the research, and mind you, my assignment was to look for the the, the nuns who were in that book. <laughs> The book, they were the nuns in the book. Uh, that was uh, really a challenge because they wanted to interview the nuns who were in the in the Edsa revolution in the book. I, I found, I discovered the nuns. Yeah. I found them somehow through through network of friends as well who are in the clergy. Yeah. And you have to build a network of friends. You don't know how, when they will really come in handy. Um, they, they can actually make your field work faster uh, and less expensive. <laughs> so uh, for, that, for everyone, uh, let, yeah. let me just say this, Ami Rara will be uh, giving uh, the input on material culture. Kaya ano, abangan ninyo, marami siyang sasabihin sa atin. Yes. Pwede bang Monday din ako? Ha? Huh? Pwede bang Monday na rin? Meron kasing ano, ah, meron na kasing schedule. You have to talk with your other group mates. If you want to do it all over on Monday, uh, please consult with all the others. Kasi may, may part two kasi yung, ano, yung inyong module. Oh, kasi uh, uh, afternoon ako, diba? Uh, uh, oh, so because I really wanted to, try to, to talk to them. <laughs> try, try to talk to them. And then uh, if they agree, then we can all do it on Monday. Oh, oh. Uh, kasi marami pa. Hindi ko si announce it. We need to announce it now because uh, all the participants are here. Uh, so we need to make the announcement by this afternoon whether you're doing it on Monday so they don't log in tomorrow. Yes, Same because time. what I plan to do is to send a lot of materials to them already so they can view it at their, home, at their own homes. 
Kasi para hindi na rito sa... Ah, okay. I mean, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll try to arrange a uh, Zoom meeting with you uh, siguro this afternoon. Uh, for now, let us go back to uh, Daniel and yeah. uh, Mio. Do you have any other thing to say? So just, just based on what Mom Amelia was saying, so I just want to distinguish two types, all right? Uh, so to what she said is basically she, they done the prior research. Right, they've done prior research on that area, and then they basically have a, a very loose storyboard or script and in order to so-called select the scenes they want, select the people they want to interview. That's one kind of mainstream documentary filmmaking, which uh, you know, people like Kara David will do. Okay, so in other words, because of cost factor, because of time factor, they are, and because they need to produce that the, the documentary pretty really fast for television, it is sort of scripted, if you like. The, the other type is the more ethnographic one, where basically, let's say if you're a researcher, a Filipino researcher like my mom Tondo, who spent six months in Kuala Lumpur, you have six months to uh, shoot, if you like, or photograph or interview, all right? So you have lots of six months of material, which later on you might want to come back to Manila and say, can I make a documentary out of that? All right, so that's that type of document, uh, ethnographic documentary filmmaking. It's much more of a process. It's much, much more like an adventure. You don't really know the ending yet, all right? So that's that kind of ethnographic filmmaking. Right. Whereas there's the other one, which basically you already get consultants or maybe an anthropologist have done many years of field work and you want to make it into a documentary, then that is the other type, right? Uh, or not all of us will have the skills of filmmaking. That's why there's also another type where they have a consultant anthropologist and then you get a seasoned documentary filmmaker, right? And the Philippines have plenty of those, right? You hire them if you have the money to work with the anthropologist to make your documentary. Okay, end of the day, it costs money. So Myung and I don't have money. So we are a one-man show. We do everything. Me too. I don't have money. <laughs> but your university has money, no? Yeah, yeah see, okay. can I add We are a add very poor to... university. <laughs> yes, uh, well, money is not the, the issue here. The, the good thing is for you to be able to work with a good team. Uh, once you have a good team in place, uh, you can really do it good. And it's uh, another thing that well, I trained into I, I trained in cinema direct. Ah, I see. Uh, with a French um, so anthropologist, with a French anthropologist. Ah. And uh, it's the one and only film that I won my first documentary. Oh, I want to watch uh, your film. It was on a sixteen millimeter. <laughs> it's on Ivaloy in Baguio. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I need to go. Yeah, because with you I'm now. from Baguio. Right. I'm from Baguio. Okay. And it's the legacy of Limon. Oh, it's right. about an Ibaloy uh, who is an uh, American retiree, uh, service retiree, pensionado yeah. from the war. And he doesn't, he, he believes in uh, making money for the afterlife, <laughs> not for the present. But uh, you, you, and she, they are into the, in, they're in the vegetable business, and they, they, uh, the wife is a money, a long, she lends money in the market, mm, and goes okay. back right. and use the money for rituals. Oh, so this is in a French French movie, is it? Not in English. No, it's uh, actually it's with the UP Film Center. UP Film Center. All right, all right. Okay. Yeah, it was sponsored by. Uh, we used to have that. It was uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I French. Know yeah, I know, I know Nick, Nick Di Ocampo and Kitlat Tahimik, so maybe I can get, yeah, yeah I'm going to watch those. I know okay, Kitlat anyway. Tahimik, uh, I know Kitlat Tahimik and Nick Di Ocampo work with him as well. Uh, but um, I, I know how they, their films, uh, I, I know how they do their films as well. But I, my, my own filmmaking is more a participatory. Mm, okay. So I, I would mean, have I, a local I, with doing the hand handling the boom or even the camera. Right. I mean, I'm doing fast thinking here. Would you be okay. willing to do it on Monday, one o'clock in the afternoon? Okay, Monday, that's one good. In the afternoon. That's fine. Uh, with okay, you. regardless of whether your uh, module uh, people agree, uh, you can actually take the Monday afternoon uh, thing. Actually, on na kami sa sa video, and then we we'll just make adjustments uh, in terms of your module. Then I just okay. inform them that if they want to proceed to tomorrow. Uh, okay lang. And then, but okay. I can send them already. I can send some of them the, the Actually, videos. Actually, bukas lang, bukas lang okay. hapon ka pa kami. Ha? Are you, uh -oh. are you dated tomorrow after that? Then that's okay. Kasi some people, si, ano, si Zona Amper and uh, si, ano, mm -hmm. si Marge will be do, giving the modules this afternoon. So tomorrow okay. afternoon, 
kung isa lang ang si ilang sa isa lang sa team ang magbibigay like si ano si Nota, Nota Magno uh, with your uh, team teammate then she can she can give it tomorrow afternoon then you can go for Monday after is that all right oh, Okay, so, Oo, kasi madaldal ako eh. Baka kasi kina, o. Oh. <laughs> kasi ako, interesado din ako sa lahat ng daldal mo eh. I'm really, really interested. Thank you. Thank you, Ami. So, thank you Actually, very much. I would, I would like to uh, offer uh, a, a possibility for you to do a documentary in Palawan. Uh, I'm transcribing, I'm, I'm doing uh, actually the diaries of Dr. Fox, uh, transcribing his field diaries. And it's very, wow. very visual. I want to give life to it by doing a documentary, uh, Dancing with the Spirits. It's on the Pagdiwata ritual. So are, who are you inviting, Ami? Sini yung lang? O kami lang? Uh, whoever has the ah, interest no. to do it. <laughs> I, I am interested. I'm getting oh, my oh. vaccine. I'm getting my vaccine tomorrow, so I am interested to move. Oh, it's really interesting. Kasi matagal na ito. It's, it's been in the drawing. Everybody has promised to come in, but they never. And then came the pandemic. So okay. the U.S. Embassy was supposed to give me a grant. But then President Trump won. So that's all. But anyway, the film, uh, the documentary film is in the drawing. Oh, still still open yeah i have the diaries okay so yeah i am interested please put me in <laughs> yes again the more okay, people there you are. So there you are it looks like you already have a ethnographic filmmaking crew in your university just Actually, get some money for drone shots buy a drone <laughs> you know we started doing a series of film documentaries on peoples of the philippines with the bookmark we just we were able to finish only two. It's on the Ifugao and on the Bali, the Dream Weavers. Mm. And then they closed the shop. So that would be a, another project which you might be interested to do with uh, putting up a Negrito Center. Yeah. And just do something on the Negritos. Yeah, because speaking as a Malaysian, right, outsider, and I, when I go to the Philippines, my mouth is watering because you have so much talent. <laughs> in filmmaking and so much stories there right you have cinema liar you know people uh, and so on and so forth you have so many national artists who are filmmakers you know uh, so on and so forth right and i think anthropology has to evolve uh to you no know, not just concentrating on ips right now we're talking about anthropology of the urban anthropology of the visual right so there's so much more possibilities and visual ethnography and visual anthropology is a very important way to engage with greater publics for education purposes, right, within schools and universities and all that, right? It is our particular craft of presenting knowledge that is missing, right? That is uh, what, from what I see from, uh, you know, in some of the documentaries I see in the Philippines, right, uh, on television. Same thing with Malaysia. Malaysia is far worse off than the Philippines. Anthropology is like way down there, right? We are into hard sciences and engineering and medical science, right? So Philippines is in, the, in a very nice spot, if you like. You have very artistic, a lot of artistic talents, right? There's so much stories to tell. Yeah. So I think that it is a fine time to, to promote visual ethnography and visual anthropology, whichever universities have the resources and the personnel to do that. And it looks like your place have already Emilia already, you know, to become a kind of bulma foundation for that. Yeah. Yes, and there's uh there's actually also another culture which I'm exploring now. It's a culture of silence. I'm working with hearing impaired. Mm. So it's an, another interesting worldview. Yeah. yeah. I, I've heard that. Okay. I've heard that. Okay, I don't know whether you still have time, but now I'm just not talking until yeah, you start. We have got the time. Uh, probably uh, Ami will be uh, discussing everything she knows uh, on Monday. Yes. Uh, Daniel, last words. A uh, few seconds, like Daniel. Last words. Uh, go, visual go. <laughs> <laughs> Mion, unmute kamo na Mion. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just thankful that I had this opportunity despite my very limited knowledge on this subject. But, you know, at least being able to share and uh, meet people like uh, Sir Daniel and Mom Amelia. Hopefully in the future, if I have time, is, um, I'm also planning to document my, my PhD journey, uh, whatever fieldwork I'm going there. And um, this is a good jumpstart. 
um, or having a visual anthropology session. That uh, for the participants, I say, you know, I hope uh, my 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 stint here <laughs> would give you um, an idea that it's not impossible for young people to engage in this particular um, enterprise. And I really hope we need more people um, who are creative and innovative in 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 the visual aspect of um, science. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank uh, you very much, Dr. Sorry, Jocelyn. Uh, yes, you can read the certificate of commendation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So, we are also uh, lucky and grateful to hear from all of our seasoned researchers, seasoned ethnographers. So, at this point in time, we shall now be having the awarding of plaque of recognition Monday. to our resource persons for this morning, Camarinas Norte State College. Uh, awards this certificate of commendation to Daniel Yeo in grateful recognition of his distinguished and invaluable service rendered as resource person during the Doing Ethnography Seminar Workshop held on July 29, 2021, thereby contributing immeasurably to the prestige and success of the event given this 29th day of July 2021 via Zoom platform. Signed by the CNSC President, Dr. Marlo M. De La Cruz. Thank you very much, sir. Same certificate of commendation is also given to Sir Romeo J. Turing Jr. in grateful recognition of his distinguished and invaluable service rendered as resource person during the Doing Ethnography Workshop Seminar held on July 29, 2021, thereby contributing immeasurably to the prestige and success of the event. Given this 29th day of July 2021 via Zoom platform, signed by the CNSC President, Dr. Marlo M. De La Cruz. Once again, sir and mom, thank you very much for your selfless sharing of all your experiences, knowledge about visual ethnography this morning. So before we end this morning session, we want to remind all our participants to please uh, answer the evaluation link, which will be given later. And we want also to request everyone to please turn on, turn on your video for our photo documentation for the morning session. Okay. Uh can we request everyone to put on their videos for documentation? Put on your videos, please. Pakita natin yung kagandahan ng mga tao. Just a minute. Ano na yung mag-screenshot lang ako. Thank you. So, dali ha. Na-adjust ang screen. Okay, one. Two, the first page, one. Two, three, smile. Second page. One, two, three, smile. Uh, yan po, dalawang pages lang naman. Maraming maraming salamat po sa pag-attend. Uh, we'll see you again. One, one fifteen siguro. I-adjust natin yes, ang one fifteen to four fifteen. Kasi dali tayo na mag-end ngayon. Maraming salamat po. See you this Thank afternoon. you very much po. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. See you this afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Daniel and Neon. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Joe. <laughs> thank you very much.